Hello and welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Abuni Ed from the United States Embassy here in Yaoundé, Cameroon, inaugurated in October 2005 by President Paul B. and then U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Jendai Fweza. According to a 2010 United States population census, at least 16,000 Americans were of Cameroonian origin. And according to another study conducted in 2016, at least 60,000 Americans today are of Cameroonian origin too, or Cameroonians living in the United States of America. And that study was updated in 2019 by the American Community Survey. But earlier, there is equally another statistic which indicates that, according to a historical account, the first enslaved Africans to be in what is today the United States of America were from what is today the Republic of Cameroon. And that partially explains why Cameroonians are curious globally of U.S. behavior and comportment globally, just like in internal politics. So, how should Cameroonians understand the behavior of the United States of America in the world today? And how should they consume their overt positions on issues like democracy, the war in Iraq, sports, and many more? My guest today on Globe Watch exclusively is the new U.S. Ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary to Cameroon, Christopher John Lamora. Christopher John Lamora, welcome to Globe Watch and thank you for exclusively talking to the Cameroon Radio Television. Thank you, Charles. Happy to be here. Well, let's start possibly with Ukraine, which is, of course, one of the hottest topics globally today of concern, a country of roughly 45 million people. And we are six months into the war in Ukraine. The Russians qualify it a special military operation. The United States plus its Western allies see it as an aggression. Do you have any timeline of an end anytime soon? Charles, I, I think the only person who knows what the end of this is going to look like and when it's going to happen is Russian President Putin. He is the one who chose to invade Ukraine, a sovereign neighbor, a fellow member of the United Nations, uh, in an unprovoked aggression. And he has inflicted over the past six months, as you noted, six months this week, uh, immense pain, immense damage on the Ukrainian country and the Ukrainian people. Well, um, you call it uh, a war of aggression. And like I said, President Putin calls it a special military operation. This is a war which is costing the global economy plus $20 billion daily. Um, Russia says if she is in Ukraine, it's simply because the West, including the U.S., fails to understand their security concern in the country. Why do you fail to understand their security concerns in this area? It's not a failure to understand security concerns, Charles. Russia, President Putin, opted to go into Ukraine. Uh, his war is a war of choice. It is a war of pretense. Uh, there was nothing that Ukraine or the Ukrainian government were doing that was a threat to Russia. Well, some accounts hold that um, in January this year, some of America's equipment in Afghanistan were already deployed in, um, in, 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 in Ukraine. And they saw this as a direct threat. And another account is that um, Russia sees Ukraine as, based on history, as very close to them and geography. And entry into NATO, which simply means the presence of American missiles in Ukraine next door to Russia is unacceptable. Why will you do such a military deployment and a possible membership of Ukraine to NATO? Well, there are, first of all, Charles, there, there are numerous countries that are members of NATO that either border Russia or are very close to Russia geographically. Ukraine is not a member of NATO currently. Um, the redeployment of any U.S. material that came out of Afghanistan 
uh, is in keeping with any country's right to engage in um, military and defense arrangements that it chooses. Uh, therefore, the ability of the Ukrainian government, the choice of the Ukrainian government to accept such material in its territory is a sovereign decision on its part. That is not inherently a threat to the security of Russia or any other neighboring countries. Well, possibly our last question on Ukraine before we talk other issues. Um, some do historical comparisons and say that if the war in Ukraine needs to end, America and the European Union must do some geopolitical calculations and they date it back to 1962 that just like um the u.s didn't accept russian missiles and military surveillance in cuba at the bay of Pigs um saga uh, which brought the world almost to a brink of a nuclear holocaust so too can russia not accept any American military presence in Ukraine. It seems to me that the key to end the war in Ukraine lies in Washington. If you give Russia the guarantee that this will never happen, the story ends tomorrow, right? No, no, I don't accept the premise of your question. Uh, I don't think that the Bay of Pigs and the situation in Ukraine are in fact remotely similar. The arguments that Moscow, that President Putin has made uh, about the threats he perceived to Russia from Ukraine are fallacy. Um, the fact of the matter is Ukraine is a sovereign nation. It's a co-equal member of the United Nations with Russia. It has been a peaceful country since its re-independence from the then Soviet Union in the early 1990s. And there's nothing that Ukraine has done or the United States has done in Ukraine that are a threat to Moscow. Let's talk sanctions and the disruptions that they have caused to the global economy. You can talk about hikes in food, you can talk about hikes in construction material, consumables around the world. Throughout history, when the U.S. was in Iraq illegally in 2003, invasion, which is just like Ukraine today, uh, the Russians say they didn't impose sanctions on you people. And even when you impose sanctions on Iran, North Korea, barely no positive results have come out. Why do we continue with the sanctions regime when we know at the end of the day nothing happens? I, I dispute that nothing happens from sanctions or that nothing comes of sanctions, but I want to come back to the original point that you started your question with, which is the increase in food prices, the unavailability of fuel. You talked about construction materials. It's not sanctions by the United States or other Western countries that have caused these disruptions to the global supply chain. It's President Putin, it's the Russian military, it's the blockage of exports from Ukraine, and also the inability of material uh, and food to get out of Russia as well. Cameroonian people are suffering. The fuel prices, the food prices that Cameroon is experiencing right now, while some of them were already in play because of COVID-19 pandemic and global economic downturn, they have been exacerbated by Russia's actions in Ukraine, not by the sanctions that have been imposed in response to the invasion. And while all of this is playing out in Ukraine, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, Antony Blinken, uh, traveled to Africa for a three-nation trip to lay out uh, the Biden's administration's arm um, African policy. This is a continent where your trip volume stands currently at roughly $90 billion, as opposed to roughly 222 from the Chinese. What are the specifics of the Biden's administration policy towards Africa? There are several things wrapped up in, in what you were asking. First of all, let me talk about the Secretary's trip to Africa and the release of the new U.S. Africa strategy. President Biden has made clear from his first days in office, that Africa was going to be a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. Um, because of Africa itself, because of the value of the relationships with Africa, the strategic nature of the relationships with Africa, the economic and trade potential, and the potential of the African people. You know, Africa is going to be a quarter of the world's population by 2050. Nigeria, just next door to Cameroon here, is going to surpass the United States as the third largest country in the world by 2050. 
Those numbers say to me that the future of the world is on this continent. And that means the U.S. would be foolish to ignore the potential and the human potential, and we want to help Africa grow to what it can be. So what are the specifics in realizing that uh, foreign policy objective in this current administration? There are a number. Um, we want to help the countries and the people of Africa to create a, a landscape economically that will allow for growth domestically in individual countries. That means more jobs for African people. It means greater educational opportunities, whether in home countries such as in Cameroon or opportunities in the United States. It means putting a, um, an investment climate in place together with African governments and African businesses that will encourage greater U.S. trade and investment. There are many, many facets to what Africa can do together with the United States. One of your former secretaries of state of blessed memory and the first woman to occupy that position, Madeleine Albright, described the United States as the indispensable nation. Do you think that in the current geopolitical trends that we see in terms of peace promotion, promotion of human rights, democracy, African countries can count on the U.S. currently? First of all, let me respond to your observation about Ambassador Albright, Secretary of State Albright. I had the pleasure and the honor of knowing her personally for many years. She was actually one of my professors in university and my advisor in university back in the late 1980s. And uh, she was a mentor. And I think in terms of her comment about the indispensable nation, uh, I think the United States has a great deal to offer the world uh, in trade, in peace, in security, uh, in democracy, although we are not perfect. Uh, so yes, I think we can be a light. Um, that's, that's what I could say in response to that comment. This is your first sit-down television interview ever since you became U.S. Ambassador to Cameroon. Clearly explain to me how specific is your mandate in Cameroon? I'm very pleased with the nature of the relationship that we have cam with Cameroon, but I think it can be stronger. Um, you mentioned earlier about our trade numbers with Africa in general. I want to see us build our trade and investment relationship with Cameroon. I want to see more American companies operating in Cameroon and more Cameroonian entrepreneurs with the ability to send their products to the United States. I think there's a tremendous potential market for Cameroonian uh, goods in the United States. Peace and security obviously are tremendously important. We have been a partner with Cameroon for many years in Cameroon's fight against terrorist organizations like Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa in the far north. And uh, we will continue to support and train Cameroonian troops in that effort. And obviously what is on everybody's mind in Cameroon and is a significant concern for the United States is the crisis in the northwest and southwest regions. And so to whatever degree I can, I want to work with the Cameroonian government with Cameroonian people and specifically the people of Northwest and Southwest to see if we can help find a path to peace. In a moment, I will talk specifically about the Northwest and Southwest. But first, um, Cameroon is US 115th trading partner uh, with trade volume of roughly 184 million of American exports that enter this country. Cameroon imports about 450 million dollars of goods uh, 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 from the United States of America. When it comes to areas like humanitarian assistance, uh, food security, what currently is the U.S. doing in Cameroon when it comes to health diplomacy? Well, the United States is the largest bilateral uh, donor to humanitarian efforts in Cameroon across the board. We give millions of dollars uh, to the World Food Program of the United Nations for food distribution that is helping to combat. And just last week you did some shipments on that. Indeed. And when I was in Douala for my first official visit there in April, I had the opportunity to look at the uh, WFP World Food Program warehouse uh, at the Douala port, uh, where they distribute food not only to Cameroon, but also to Chad and other countries in the Central Africa region. Um, on health security, we have worked for many years in the area of HIV and AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and of course, over the last two and a half years, COVID-19. 
and we are very proud of the relationship with Cameroon and the progress that Cameroon has made uh, in achieving HIV uh, epidemic control targets. And Cameroon's on track, actually, to be the first country in West and Central Africa to hit the globally established targets for epidemic control in HIV. And I think that's in large measure because of our cooperation. Let, let, let me just hang on on COVID-19. We saw countries giving their own assistance in terms of money. The Swiss announced about 3.5 billion CFA francs. The Chinese gave tons and tons of masks. The Israeli even said of establishing uh, a component of their production center here in Yaoundé. Specifically in this domain, what did the U.S. do in Cameroon? Well, I think we need to look at two things, Charles. Okay. One is, what did we do specifically in response to the COVID pandemic? Mm. Uh, and that includes significant provision of vaccines, mm. both directly from the United States government and through the international facilities like COVAX. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's important to look at the groundwork we had laid before. The work that I was talking about a minute ago that we've done in HIV and AIDS over the past two decades helped to build Cameroon's health infrastructure, to build its laboratory capacity, its disease vector monitoring, and lots of other things that provided a platform so that when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, Cameroon's medical infrastructure was much better placed to respond. Northwest and Southwest, which of course has been a bone of contention for the past uh, five years, especially when it comes to Cameroon-US relations. Emmanuel Macron was here a while ago, a few days ago. The French president clearly stated France's support for Cameroon's constitutional order through the backing of decentralization as one of the key gateways to end the conflict in the Northwest and Southwest. Is America on the one Cameroon policy too? You mean one Cameroon in terms of territorial integrity? Sure. It is incumbent on the Cameroonian government, the Cameroonian people, and specifically the people of the Northwest and Southwest regions to have continuing conversations about what the future looks like. What I have said very clearly, what the U.S. government has said very clearly, is there is no military solution to the situation in the Northwest and Southwest regions. Achieving peace and getting the people back to their pre-crisis uh, lives that they need, that they deserve, can only be achieved through discussion. Oh, okay. You know that uh, back in 2019, there was, of course, the holding of the major national dialogue here. Um, from time to time, people say maybe they don't understand what the U.S. say about uh, dialogue. dialogue. <laughs> what is your own version of dialogue? I think, it, I think we get hung up sometimes mm -hmm. on word choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was the Grand National Dialogue, and there were a lot of things that came out of that. You talked about decentralization. That would be the realization of something that was already in the Cameroonian Constitution and the Cameroonian law. So uh, we want to continue to encourage the Cameroonian authorities to follow through with decentralization. I've had a lot of conversations since I've been here in Yaoundé these past six months. And one recurring theme that I have heard is the need for more funds to go to the regions from the central budget in Yaoundé. And I know that that is a work in progress. It's not easy. We've talked about COVID. We've talked about food prices and fuel prices. There are a lot of demands on the Cameroonian government budget. But I think that putting the money into the, the regions that was uh, committed I is a good start. Uh, but coming back to your dialogue question, whether you call it a dialogue, a conversation, a discussion, the point is peace can only be uh, achieved peacefully. Um, before this interview comes to an end, we will talk sports. But, um, uh, one of the issues when it comes to the Northwest and Southwest equally, and I've heard this conversation from several people, um, they say that there is a portion of the Cameroonian diaspora living in the United States of America, foiling all of this, and Yaoundé says that from time to time she has written to Washington to have these people liberated, that she qualifies terrorists, creating chaos, and that they even go against the rules and regulations of the U.S. Patriot Act of 2001, and which you know clearly better than I do. How do you respond to such comments when you look at what they do on social media, for example, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, which are basically American companies? So I have seen a lot of the videos that you're referring to, oh. and I am very troubled by, and we all should be troubled by, 
videos where people are calling for violence, where people are suggesting that killing students and preventing them from going to school is somehow a valid approach to resolving underlying social concerns. It isn't, and it never will be. Um, the people in the diaspora, be they in the United States or elsewhere, who have been calling over the past several years for violence uh, need to stop. There's no question about that. This is what I was saying a minute ago. Violence is not the answer. Violence is never going to be the answer. People need to have a peaceful conversation. Those who are encouraging attacks on schools, the burning of hospitals, the shooting of people who violate these imposed regulations by the non-state armed groups, um, those, those calls for violence just need to stop. One of the key priorities of President Biden's uh, administration is climate change. Um, in December, there will be a U.S.-Africa summit uh, that will be taking place. How crucial is um, climate change, human rights, democracy, and promotion of the defense of minority rights uh, across the gender board? How, how critical are these issues for Washington now in foreign policy realization? Well, I'll grab two of the things you just talked about, climate change and human rights. Mm. They are both fundamentally important. Mm. You know, President Biden appointed former Secretary of State John Kerry mm. as the special presidential envoy for climate. Um, it's the first time we have had someone of that stature in a position of that nature specifically focused on this issue. Mm. Climate is one of those things that does not recognize borders. Um, and I think Africa and Cameroon specifically have a lot to contribute positively to resolving the climate crisis. Cameroon sits in the Congo Basin. It's the second largest rainforest in the world. It's a huge carbon sink. And if we continue to try to manage well that resource, we will c contribute to reducing the effects of climate change globally. On human rights, it is absolutely a centerpiece to what we are doing, not just in Cameroon, but around the world. Um, the promotion of human rights, the protection of the dignity of every individual, regardless of whatever ethnicity or religion or any other group they may belong to, is fundamental. The violation of human rights is a threat to us all. The violation of human rights creates disenfranchisement. It creates dissent. It creates anger. And people want to feel included. People want to feel like they are a part of their government, a part of their country. Promotion of human rights not only is the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do, but because it creates stability for the long term. Finally, um, you know that football is a religion in Cameroon, and it's one of the most uniting factors in, in, in reality when they talk about football in Cameroon, we don't know all those issues that you were just mentioning, whether you have which gender, you have which base, you come from where all those things don't exist. Um, Cameroon qualified to play in the World Cup this year, and um, a few weeks ago, the Cameroon Football Federation uh, announced um, one all sports as the new equipment uh, supplier for the Indemotable Lions. I have watched Cameroonian television, I have read Cameroonian newspapers. I have listened to Cameroonian radio. I have checked Cameroonian online. And they all conclude it's an American company. It's One All Sports, an American company. So One All Sports was the choice of FECAFOOT, of the Cameroonian Football Federation. And what we want, as I said earlier, is we want there to be greater US trade and investment relations with Cameroon. Um, I think what's important isn't so much whether One All Sports is an American company as was it the company that FECAFOOT decided was best going to meet the team's equipment needs. They have drawn that conclusion and I wish them success in the contract. So the U.S. Ambassador to Cameroon is not confirming and is not rejecting whether One All Sports is an American company. My understanding is that One All Sports has connections to the United States. I do not know for certain where they are registered legally. They may be registered in multiple countries. Finally, um, this program marks 10 years this year. 
The first um, guest on Globe Watch was the former United States Ambassador to Cameroon, Robert B. Jackson, with whom you worked twice in your career. First as Principal Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs in Washington, and in his last months in Ghana as U.S. Ambassador to uh, the Republic of Ghana. How much of Globe Watch have you watched ever since you came to Cameroon? I have seen quite a number of your programs. Uh, I will admit that I've watched more since we agreed that we were going to do this interview, but I have seen a number of them. And I've gone back and looked at some of your older interviews. Um, one that I was particularly struck by was your interview with Dr. John Kengasong, who is a Cameroonian American who was at the time you interviewed him uh, at the Africa Centers for Disease Control and recently was named by President Biden as our global HIV and health security coordinator. So now he is ambassador, Dr. John Kengasong. And uh, I was very impressed with, with that interview. Dr. Kengasong does good credit to Cameroon and, and to the United States as a Cameroonian American. As you mentioned at the beginning in your opening remarks, many, many Cameroonian Americans are contributing uh, to our collective growth and development, and, and he is among the most prominent. Well, the majority of former Global Watch guests have all become big people, including Samantha Power, who was here, <laughs> the former U.S. UN ambassador, who is now the uh, administrator of the United States Agency for International Development, the U.S. ambassador to Cameroon, extraordinary and plenipotentiary, Christopher John Lamora. Thank you very much indeed for being guest on Global Watch. Thank you, Charles. You're welcome.